All right, everybody. Good evening for Seattle Boat Show Live. Uh, it looks like we had a little glitches on our video transmission there. And so uh, uh, I jumped right in. We're going to cover that dead air time. And uh, unfortunately, as uh, I'm solo as your host, I'm Mark Bunzel, the editor and publisher of the Wagner Cruising Guide. And joining me are Leonard and Lorena Landon. And uh, I know they're here somewhere. I don't see them. Uh, anyway, uh, 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 Leonard and Lorena are joining us from Sitka, Alaska. They've been cruising through Alaska and the entire summer, updating the Wagner Guide and looking for new and different things going on in, in Southeast Alaska. And uh, all this information will get into the 2022 uh, Wagner Guide. So we lost them right now, but let, we'll have them back in a few moments. Uh, we've had spectacular weather. I started out, uh, uh, those of you who were watching the show last week, I uh, visited Sarasota, Florida. And surprisingly, Sarasota was not boiling hot, uh, but uh, uh, actually not bad. A lot of fantastic boating going on down there. But they don't have trees and, and uh, uh, beautiful uh, mountains like we do. So uh, made me appreciate getting back to Washington uh, better. And luckily, when I got back, the temperatures had, had subsided uh, from where they were when I left, when it was over 100 degrees the previous Sunday. So it's great to be back. And uh, I'm going to be headed out finally to do my summer research. And I'll be headed out uh, on uh, Monday morning and headed south and hitting uh, LaConnor and uh, Langley and Everett and Edmonds and just working my way in, seeing what's new and different. So I'm pretty excited to get back out on the water. So I'll be out there Saturday getting everything ready, fueling the boat, and uh, uh, I'm looking forward to a good time on the water. Leonard Lorena, I told everybody that you're in Sitka. What can you report from Sitka? Any good salmon on the dock? Okay, I'm not sure we have the Landons here. It looks like the screen is frozen and uh, hopefully they'll, they'll join us. They may be having a connection problem. And uh, so uh, the weather has been fantastic and I wanna warn you that uh, even though we've got high pressure, that high pressure can sometimes turn into uh, some pretty heavy winds on the water and can create some rough conditions. So be careful in going out, don't get suckered in by, by the sunny weather. There could be some heavy winds behind that and make sure you're comfortable with it. Landons, are you with us now? Yes, now we're, we're with you. Sorry, uh, we had some uh, unstable connection here in Sitka, so we'll see how it goes here. <laughs> are we well, coming through uh, okay right now? Uh, that, yeah, we're, if you could give, give us an update on the marinas and some of the news and even what's going on in Sitka. You bet. We're going to kind of start from the south and go north. Uh, some news about the Pacific salmon. And of course, that's always been a concern in both BC and Washington state with the dwindling numbers. Apparently, uh, the catches are decreasing and low returns over the last few years. And uh, BC has a report that uh, the habitat has been degraded impacts of flood control measures, 
uh, predators, of course, fishing activity and threats of disease have caused uh, a decline. And uh, their fisheries and oceans uh, put out a report. Um, uh, they are uh, recommending that uh, fish farming should be handled by agriculture and agri food division in Canada and the Department of Fisheries and Oceans uh, are, should be responsible for the wild salmon uh, 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 restoration. So that's what they're working on. Uh, the main predators are seals and sea lions. Uh, the seal populations in Georgia Strait have increased tenfold between 1972 and 2000. Uh, and that's been proportional with the decline in the sport fishing in that area. Uh, so a proposal has been submitted for commercial and First Nation harvesting of seals and sea lions. Um, and in June of 2021, this year, the government announced 647 million federal investment to save BC's wild salmon. And then in uh, Columbia River, they also have a challenge in uh, saving the salmon. Uh, legislation has been put forth uh, to approve the kill of 800, 840 sea lions and a portion of the Columbia River and its tributaries over the next five years uh, to boost the survival again of salmon and steelhead. Uh, the legislation for the first time allows killing of stellar sea lions in addition to California sea lions. And this will be in a 200 mile stretch of the main uh, stem of the Columbia between uh, Bonneville and McNary dams. And the kill operations would begin uh, uh, this fall. And instead of the use of firearms, they would use a combination of trapping and darting with uh, lethal injection to be more humane. So that's news there. The Washington legislature approved 462,000 for the program and 300,000 in federal funds was also budgeted for the program. And of we course- We had a question on the chat line that I'm just gonna interrupt you for a second. Uh, somebody asked if we're going to be talking about mooring buoys and yes, Hang on, we have our <laughs> special guest for that. Uh, uh, Reed is uh, Parker standing by, but uh, we have a, just a few more updates before we get to Reed. Sorry, okay. Lorraine, go ahead. Uh, of course, uh, the, the whales love salmon, so that's important. And we have a few whale stories, interesting stories. Uh, humpback whale was entangled in some commercial fishing gear off the waters of Nanaimo and fisheries and oceans marine mammal response uh, freed the whale. He was about 40 feet in length. And there was uh, 3,000 feet of rope entangled around this whale. The operation took uh, six hours, four hours to just disentangle the whale. And uh, of course, they need to study beforehand what's the safest process to free the whale. Uh, so that was interesting. And I think Probably folks uh, saw the news, uh, the news story about the orca, the transient orca that uh, came up to a family in their 17 foot boat and nudged it around and spun it around and kind of played with it. The family did the right thing. They turned off their engine and kept calm and, and all ended well. That took place in Saratoga Passage. And there's video and then, of that on Facebook, right? Or, or is it right. YouTube? There's, there's video out there if you want to see it. And you can just imagine to yourself what you would feel like if you had a whale of that size pushing around your rib or Boston whaler. We have one more whale story. It's probably the best one. It's, it's hard to believe. It's a Jonah and the whale story. This happened on the East Coast. And a lobster diver was collecting lobsters in the sandy bottom of the ocean and a humpback whale came along. And of course, when they feed, they open their mouths uh, quite uh, kind of like an umbrella and it blocks their vision and they scoop up their prey and he was scooped up 
uh, inside, actually inside the mouth of this humpback whale. He could feel the muscles of the mouth closing in on him. He had his scuba gear on, he was struggling around with that. And he thinks it was about 30 or 40 uh, uh, seconds. The whale came to the surface and spit him out. He survived, no broken bones. He did have some uh, muscle damage, uh, but recuperated in the hospital and is doing fine. But that, that was incredible uh, to, to read about that and see that uh, on the news. What's happening locally? Well, locally, our Wagoner field correspondents are doing a great job. Uh, Dale and Kathleen Blackburn report that Point Hudson Marina no longer takes reservations by phone. They do take them online through the Malo reservation system, and it's an excellent system. It actually shows you the availability. You can choose the slip you want if it shows that it's available. If you need to cancel your reservation, you do need to call them or email them to cancel. There is a registration fee at the time of booking and then they email the uh, mortgage uh, balance due. This is noteworthy because it's different than the uh, third party booking systems that are out there that are in between, uh, that are not inventory control. So this one really has inventory control on the different slips. So it shows you exactly what's available. It lets you pick the slip you want right now. That's pretty good. And uh, it's kind of the system that we, I think we need out there as boaters. So that I, I want this slip. Uh, and I know this is my slip, but I preserved it. And uh, apparently Boat Haven at Port Townsend is still first come first serve. So the reservations are for uh, Point Hudson. And then Wagner Field Correspondent, Sandy and Will Duplich, uh, report that if you're landing a dinghy or a kayak on Dungeness Spit near Squim, you need to land in the designated area south of the lighthouse between two yellow markers. And apparently the markers are a little hard to, to find, but they're yellow poles and you land between those yellow markers. And you should also contact the Dungeness National Wildlife Refuge Office before landing. And of course, no dogs allowed on shore since this is a wildlife sanctuary. And the, to contact the wildlife on that, the phone number is on wagonerguide.com forward slash updates and go out there and look for uh, Dungeness Spit and you'll find this update in there along with the phone number. And uh, news for BC residents and boaters, uh, British Columbia uh, have removed uh, most of their COVID-19 restrictions they allow outdoor gatherings up to 5,000 people. About 78% of BC folks have been vaccinated. Restaurants and pubs no longer have limits on the number of diners. Uh, casinos and nightclubs are open with some uh, barriers in place. And be aware that some businesses may still want you to wear uh, face masks. And it's reported that all COVID restrictions in BC are expected to be removed on Labor Day, September 6. And Canadians who are returning home that have been fully vaccinated can now skip the 14 day quarantine. So that's good news for them. And good news from Haida Gwaii, uh, BC tourists that have been fully vaccinated are welcome back now to Haida Gwaii. And uh, Guayanas National Park is open now for, again, for off-island visitors. And they ask that uh, uh, visitors be fully vaccinated and they appreciate you signing the Haida Gwaii Visitor Pledge that uh, you'll be safe and that you have been vaccinated. And of course, July 21, the border between US and Canada is still closed until July 21. That's the next date to I'll make a decision regarding the partial opening or full opening or continued closure for non-essential travel. And we understand that uh, uh, Justin Trudeau is considering uh, some sort of opening possibly for those that have been vaccinated, but he has given no timeline. It's still under discussion at this point. So the border is still closed right now. Uh, they, uh, as Lorena mentioned, they're, they're making some concessions, they're making some changes, but the border is still closed. And we've come to the conclusion that it's a much, much, it's definitely a political decision more than it is anything else. But uh, hopefully something will open up pretty soon. 
uh, hopefully something will allow us to cross that border. Um, Southeast Alaska updates, uh, cruise ships. Uh, the absence of the cruise ships up here is definitely not notable, but it, it uh, points up more and more the, the no large number of uh, pocket cruise ships. So the small ones that are up here with 100 passengers or less, we find them all over the place. So the National Geographic ones, there are a whole variety of them with different uh, logos and different times and uh, different, slightly different sizes on them. But they're, we find them in remote locations. It's very fine. And they, they all seem to have the same thing. They have a, about a half a dozen tenders that they have out there. And they have a whole slew of kayaks and some very eager people to go out there and discover wonderful things here in Southeast Alaska. Um, we had uh, we've been to Pelican, the small village of Pelican. And that one's doing very well. It's uh, come alive. The, re the cannery that closed about uh, nine, 10 years ago has been repurposed as a, a fish processing plant, and that's a specialty fish processing. And they uh, they have fresh and frozen seafood, and they're quite welcome to having visiting recreational boaters come in there and place an order, purchase what you want. Again, it's fresh, frozen, uh, different sizes. You don't have to have a, take the whole fish. You can get fillets, whatever you want. Halibut, salmon, uh, shellfish, a variety. They were very accommodating with that. We had dinner at uh, one of the fishing lodges there at Pelican. Uh, we joined the fishing lodge guests there. And uh, that was a very a lovely dinner, wonderful. And again, the Pelican's doing very well. Very, uh, seems very alive right now. We went into Gustavus, which is just off of Ga Glacier Bay National Park and uh, uh, checked out the dock there. The dock is busy. It's very open, uh, open to the wind and to weather and to the seas. Uh, the time to be there, by the way, it's the, the recreational dock sits right behind the, uh, the ferry terminal. So the ferry terminal is parallel to the, or the ferry docks parallel to the recreational float. And you want to be there when the ferry is there because it blocks most of, the, <laughs> most of the seas that are coming in. But it's a very busy place, maximum of two hour stay, no overnight stays, no power, no water on the dock. A uh, quaint little village you can hike into. And Glacier Bay National Park was open. We had our, got a permit on a 40 day, 48 hour notice, 48, two days, 48 hour notice on that. Had no problem getting in and uh, was a lovely stay in Glacier Bay. We had wonderful weather, which by the way, is the right way to see Glacier Bay National Park is with good weather. So if you can do that, uh, schedule your time there when there's good weather forecast. And uh, we, had, we were at Elfin Cove. I wanted to play, we, we were there for the 4th of July. And uh, we happened to uh, enjoy the oops, second, I got a share screen here. We had some video that we shot from some of the uh, Fourth of July activities. And uh, this one happens to be, this was the fish toss that we were doing and uh, tossing it until you move, drop the fish and step back one piece. But it's so smart to have a car. They were standing there. They were standing there. They were standing there. They were standing there. Is it barefoot? And then uh, after that, uh, after that they did the bobbing, but it's uh, bobbing for, and we'll show the video. <laughs> <laughs> so that's bobbing for fish heads, a uh, very unique thing. This is a fishing village, Elfin Cove, and so all these are, are water related. And then the. <laughs> The highlight of the day was the uh, the event for grease, grease pole event where you uh, had to slide on your feet out to the end of this pole over the water and grab the flag. Two thousand dollars for the winner if you could do that. Uh, you, they just kept going. It was over an hour and they were still competing. And finally, somebody got it. He slid all the way out to the end, grabbed the flag, and uh, uh, but they must have been frozen by the end of the event. <laughs> It was cold water. <laughs> this is a this is a tiny village of uh, six full-time year-round residents, 
and uh, the population surges to 40 in the summertime. So lots of fishing village, uh, sport fishing lodges there and a uh, small fish processing plant is there. Uh, uh, anybody who's watching, if you get a chance to spend the 4th of July in Southeast Alaska, it's a special event. You know, uh, uh, Alaska is one of our newest states and uh, uh, they just go all out to celebrate being part of the United States. It's very heartwarming. Well, we have Reed Parker with us this evening from uh, the Washington State uh, Parks. And he lived at one time in Ketchikan and, and he says he misses it. He loves being out on the water. He worked for DNR in Washington for a while and uh, uh, he loves his current job because it allows him to be out with his boat out on the water, uh, checking on uh, mooring buoys. And he's here to tell us all about mooring buoys uh, and answer all of our questions. And I'm sure, I know we have questions and folks in the listening can uh, submit their questions in chat. And uh, Reed, we're so happy to have you. He's uh, head of the Marine um, uh, Crew Division for the entire state of Washington. So take it away, Reed. Reed, you're, you're either one of the most popular people <laughs> or maybe not so sometimes. Or not so popular, potentially. Yeah. <laughs> but, well, I, will, I do want to make a plug for Southeast Alaska. Uh, what Mark said about July 4th in Southeast Alaska rings very true for me. I, I worked for the Forest Service for a whole bunch of years based in Ketchikan. And the 4th of July parade was one of the highlights uh, we had our own marching band. There was, it was a big, big giant party and with all the cruise ship tourists and everybody else. And then uh, the slug race was our kind of most popular goofy, <laughs> goofy game. So you'd, you'd bet on your slug or you'd bet they, there was also a rubber duck race down the creek. So uh, Southeast Alaska is pretty great. And uh, there's lots of silly stuff there for sure. Um, but I'm here to talk about buoys. So I'm going to share my screen real quick. Uh, and then, uh, then we can start talking about buoys. So let me do this correctly. All right. Well, thanks so much for having me. Um, there's a weird green line there. I don't know if that's mine, but um, I'm Reed Parker. Again, I'm the Marine Crew Supervisor for Washington State Parks. I've been working for state parks just about five months now, so pretty new, um, but I've been around boats mostly in Southeast Alaska, and then since moving here, some. Um, the Marine, I'm gonna talk kind of generally about our Marine maintenance program that I am a part of, and then we'll talk specifically about buoys next. So um, this photo in the center, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but this photo in the center is our big workboat, the Thunderbird, 75 foot steel landing craft uh, built in the mid eighties. And that's what we use when we go do a lot of our work. And then we, this boat here in the right photo, this aluminum landing craft is our uh, kind of go, go do fast stuff boat here. Um, so if you see us out on the water, give a, give a wave. Um, we are, let's see. How do I do this? There we go. Um, like I said, we're a statewide crew. So we maintain docks, boat launches, floats, ramps, buoys. Um, more than there's, you know, water-based infrastructure at more than 50 parks in Washington State, uh, 35 of which are on Puget Sound, and that's, you know, mostly what we're going to focus on today. But there are moor mooring buoys at some of the lakes on the east side. There's, we're going to go work on a boat launch at Beacon Rock on the Columbia later this summer. Um, I heard that Lake Chelan needs some work. So we, we go do work kind of all over the place. Um, we're based at Deception Pass in Cornette Bay, just on the inside of Deception Pass. So that's where our shop and our boats are moored. That way we can kind of get around, get, get to the Olympic Peninsula pretty quickly. Um, South Sound is the farthest we go by boat and can take quite a while. Uh, recently, we did a trip down to um, Hope Island to help them pump some outhouses down there. And it's about a 14 hour run in our landing craft, the Thunderbird. So 
um, we don't go fast, but we get there eventually. And uh, we, we love our work. So here to talk about buoys. Um, here's a general location map of all the buoys. We have about 250, 260 buoys. These colors I'll talk about in a couple minutes, but this shows the extent of where our buoys are. Our, you know, our home base is here at Deception Pass. We've got a big pile of buoys in the San Juans, um, some in the Olympics, Olympic area, some you know, down in the Blake Illahee area, some down in Hood Canal, and then a whole bunch of buoys down here in the in the south part of the sound. So um, go a little deeper. So why are buoys important? Um, you know, primarily it allows for safe access for the public, people who aren't as experienced. Um, who are, you know, in a storm, it's pretty nice to get on a buoy instead of being on your hook. So, uh, you know, primarily it's, it's access, public access. And then we also really encourage the use of mooring buoys to protect the eelgrass habitat and, you know, macroalgae from the impacts of anchoring. Places with eelgrass, some places we have buoys out, you know, hoping that people will not anchor in the eelgrass areas. Um, but generally, whenever there's a buoy available, it's better for the bottom to, to get on that buoy than versus being on your hook. So um, one of the things that came up when we were talking about this in our group was people wanting to know, how do you tie off to a buoy? I'm not technically savvy enough to get a video going for you, but um, some key things to be thinking about when you come up to a buoy is have somebody, you know, if you have a second person, having that person either on the bow or on a side where you can see them and the buoy, um, that person with a boat hook, if you can come alongside and grab that buoy amidship with your boat hook um, and then walk it to the front of the boat, that really saves a lot of like hanging off the front end of the boat. I was gonna try to get some old photos. I couldn't get them off my other computer, but uh, the buoys we had for the forest service in Southeast Alaska, they were, like three or four tires high in a stack. Um, and you could jump off your bow and stand on the buoy to tie yourself off. But our buoys aren't that substantial. You can't stand on our buoys without getting pretty wet. Um, but if you can, you know, get your, get, get your buoy, get the buoy towards the bow of the boat. Like this sailboat has a line, you know, from either side of the bow, uh, coming through and, and back to the cleat. That's the ideal. It's if you can get a, a line from either side to a cleat on your boat, then it'll it'll ride much, much smoother. Um, I was also gonna tell you a story of the 30, we had a 30 foot pilot house sailboat, a Rawson in uh, Ketchikan. It's a great boat, super great Southeast boat. You know, you could drive from inside when the weather got snotty, which it frequently did. Um, one night we, my wife and I had just fallen asleep. Our baby was sleeping in his little berth and, oh, uh, wind came in the, this little channel. We were in this really protected place and the wind came in for 10 minutes into that spot and it blew about 40 and I didn't have enough line out on, uh, going to the buoy and our bowsprit banged on the top of that buoy over and over. And it sounded like the boat was going to come apart. It was one of the scariest experiences of my wife's life. I was, I had to go out on deck with a headlamp and the snot in the dark to let out more line. It wasn't that fun. Um, it was very memorable in the lower of our family. So um, you can let out a bunch of line. That's great. And uh, let's see a couple, a couple other things we wanted you to know about our buoys is they're first come first serve. We, um, you have to pay for them. And in most places you pay for them on land. So you have to go to land to pay, pay your mortgage. Um, we did start a pilot program down at Gerald Cove this summer um, where you can, where each buoy has a number on it and you can call our, um, I guess like a reservation line to pay for it from your boat with a, there's a service fee, but you can, you don't have to go to shore. You can pay by credit card from your, from your cabin, which is pretty sweet. Um, I, they will probably always be, be, they will always be first come first serve. Um, you know, people need to be able to get them, get on them for safety the reservations. I, I don't really see working because, um, 
because you never know if you're going to get there and people would reserve them months in advance. Um, just like a, you know, like a campground sort of, but we don't, we, they need to stay first come for serve. Uh, single vessels up to 45 feet in length. There may be some old stickers on some of our buoys that talk about, you know, certain sizes, size limits and rafting, but all of our newer, more recently installed buoys say no rafting. Um, that's to protect the integrity of the anchor and the line. Uh, we'll talk about the different anchors that we have out there here in a second. Uh, moving on to lineal mortgage systems. So we, you may have seen some of these lineal mortgage systems out and about. This one is at Reed Harbor um, on Stewart Island in the San Juans. And it's, there's three of these big yellow floating cans and they, are, they have anchors going off at different angles. And then there's lines between them. And so these boats are side tied in a number of places to the lines. This allows you know, a number of boats to get into a, a tighter area. Um, there, you know, you can see that these, these were used. There were so many boats in Reed Harbor. There were probably, I don't know, a hundred boats in Reed Harbor this week and on a, on a Tuesday night. So I can imagine what it was like on the fourth. Um, but this allows a bunch of boats to get in into a tight spot. So that's, that's another thing we have. We only have maybe five or six of these in our whole system. So talking about mooring buoys now, um, we, let's see, we have, you know, I said about 250 buoys. Um, we had a survey, we contracted with, with a marine consultancy to dive on every single buoy that we have in our system. Our, the crew that I supervise had historically was a diving crew that, that worked that put these boot anchors down and did all the diving work. Um, because of regulatory issues with the number of staff you need to do commercial diving, we don't dive any longer. And so we needed a, and because of all the workload that we have, uh, you know, there's a lot of deferred maintenance on the buoys. And so we contracted with a consulting firm to do an assessment of every single buoy throughout the whole system. Um, we break our, you know, break the Puget Sound into regions for your purposes. It doesn't matter. It's just, it's, you know, it's Puget Sound. Um, but, you know, we knew that there, so as a result, you know, we found that, hey, some of our anchors aren't good. Some of, some of our buoys are definitely missing. Um, you know, about half the buoys are in fair or satisfactory condition and don't need any work. Um, so that's the, the assessment's done. We know what we have. This was all in April of 2021. Um, and so now we're starting to work in the next phase, which is to do the repairs. This graphic, I don't know if you can see it. I, yeah, I can put this up. So if you can see the graphic, um, it shows a schematic of what the buoys look like. So there's, we had two types of anchors. There's either a concrete block like this or a screw in they're called helical. Uh, it's a, basically a big auger screw that is screwed into the seafloor. So we have the helicals or a concrete anchor. Uh, and then we have a chunk of line, double braid line with a midline float. This midline float keeps the line off the, off the seabed keeps it from, you know, getting tangled around the anchor, keeps it from drag any, if the, at low tide, the chain could potentially drag. So just keeps everything up so that we're not impacting the seabed. And then we have a short chunk of chain, typically 10 feet, and then our buoy. Um, so that's, that's the layout of, of nearly every buoy we have. Um, and the, the, you know, the, the limiting factor for us right now, we're about to start work on replacing as many of the, the tackle systems as we can from, from the anchor, you know, including the buoy all the way to the top. Um, the, the more difficult part is the anchor replacement. So let's talk about the next, oh, okay, here's, so I've got some maps. This is Susha um, in the San Juans. So it's, let's see, there's Stuart, here's Susha. So at Susha, we have a pile of buoys. And so this kind of shows you the green is satisf 
you know, it was satisfactory in the report by the consultants, the yellow were fair, and then the kind of pink and red are ones that need, that need to be addressed or are missing. Um, so this just shows you how many buoys, this is one island. Um, many of you may have been to Susha, it's beautiful and super popular. Um, so we'll be going out, we'll be going out to start to do some work at Susha here pretty soon. Uh, our repair work that we have planned for 2021 is um, to get to every buoy and anchor. We have contracted with an Arcus-based diving company called Genje, named Genje. They are kind of the subject matter experts in mooring buoys and anchors, and um, they're also biologists, and they do a lot of eelgrass surveys for us. So they're going to, starting next week, um, and probably for about, it'll probably take us through the end of the year, but we're gonna to get to all the buoys and anchors. Any anchor that is good, we're gonna replace all the tackle above the anchor. And we're gonna reevaluate all the anchors again to see if there's some way where we can reuse the ones that we have. Um, so, the, and then like I said, the work <laughs> beginning next week, we're gonna do over about a five day, six day work period. We're gonna, we're gonna work on 50 buoys in the San Juans. And then the first week in August, we'll be at Blake Island to an Illahee to look at their buoys, replace what we can. And then late August, we'll be down in the South Sound. We haven't nailed down the locations for that work, but we're trying to hit the highest priority, you know, things that are in the worst condition that have the most use, trying to, trying to weigh those things. Um, so that's what we have planned for this year. Reed, a question came in on the chat line while you were presenting there, and maybe you're going to address it, but what about new buoys? Is that coming right. up? So here we go. So future work. This is, this is new buoys are in the future work. So um, permitting, so we're, so the, the future, so here's kind of our future work. So we're going to have, we're going to get to every buoy, dive on every buoy every other year with our contractor. We have a five-year contract with our contractor. So um, every year, our crew will go out and we'll check the connections that we can reach from the surface at low tide. And then we'll have the divers go look at the line, clean the lines, look at the lines, and look at the anchors every two years. This year, we're also going to begin planning and permitting for new anchors in places where our anchors have failed. So um, where we already have permits. And so that involves, uh, we want to use a new helical screw it's really tough to get permits for concrete block anchors. Um, the only places we could use it is someplace where the seabed doesn't allow a helical to, to um, you know, to get enough, enough depth, enough holding power. Um, helical screws are really the, the industry standard at this point. So we need to do some design and engineering to figure out what's the best helical screw that'll last the longest. Um, we need to, we have some issues with our DNR aquatic lands leases do our permitting um, and then consultation with tribal governments. And because of the scope, you know, because we're all the way up the Canadian border, all the way to Olympia, um, there's a lot of tribal consultation that has to go on with that. So the priority being though, to replace anchors at the current location. And then the next phase will be to assess new locations for suitability um, based on, you know, seabed and what, you know, if there's eelgrass and, and the capacity of our program to install and maintain because right now it's about a thousand dollars a buoy to maintain um, and give or take and so um, but that doesn't involve the permitting and the installation to get those buoys in and then the long-term the long-term maintenance so if one of the questions that i had heard before was who do i call if there's an issue with a buoy um, the best place to to contact is our info center. And that is for all state parks. Um, that anything that goes to those folks will get to the appropriate place. If you contact a ranger in a park, um, that info might not get to us or it might not get to whoever, whoever needs to be the person. Um, if we're out for a while working remote, we may not get the memo. So um, our general parks info center is the place to go. And then, questions for me. So this is out at Susha um, and the, the dock that we have out there. And that's our, that's our boat Thunderbird. 
So questions, what, put me on the hot seat. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I forget. Oh, oh. Reed, we got, we got one question that came in. What about the missing buoys? Is, are you already aware of those or should people take the time to report a missing buoy? Um, I'd say at this point, we're aware of, of where everything is. And if we're not, we'll find it pretty quickly when we go do the work. Um, in the next you know, couple months. But after the next couple months, once we start getting new buoys on, buoy lines get cut, um, you know, anchors could fail, even the anchors that we think are good can fail. So um, if all the buoys around you look new and you find one missing, then definitely let us know, because we definitely need to know. And Reed, how are you assessing new locations? Uh, is that the contractors or you have others? For new new anchors, we haven't gotten. We're we're still a ways from trying to figure that out. I think at this point we're we're really just focused on maintain what we have, replace what is missing, or we can't, you know, replace anchors that we that are unsuitable right now. We haven't got we haven't gotten to the assessment of like, oh, where do we want to put new new buoys? That's we're still at least a couple of years from that. Uh, and Reed, do you have, uh, are there plans and uh, as you upgrade or improve, are there plans to bring the, the state park buoys up to the 50 foot standard uh, that DNR has for their buoys? For a depth set? Uh, no, I'm for sorry, for, for boat size, for the size. Oh, of for boat size. Um, I don't think so. Uh, there, we haven't had that conversation. Um, I think because we have such a mishmash of stuff and we don't wanna we don't wanna set an expectation that 50 feet is okay when we have so many things that with you know it would be great if we added all all of our new anchors were 50, you know, 50 foot or something. But I think we'll probably stick with the 45 is my guess. And then, what else? The the question on the chat about how do the how do the how are the Gila coil screws installed? Sure. I'm curious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's a giant auger, and um, on the Thunderbird, there used to be some there used to be these big spuds that would go down and hold the boat in place, and then they had a hydraulic. They like slipped the auger, the screw auger, in, and they had a big giant hydraulic drill. Um, now the industry standard is just a diver on the bottom with a hydraulically powered drill, you know, hydra hydraulics on the surface, hydraulic line, and they can, they just drive it in from, from under in the water. Um, the ones we had put in in the past, it was like a two inch round pipe, hollow pipe. The new standard is a smaller diameter, but solid shaft uh, auger. You said that there's a mishmash of different anchorings right now in the in the park buoys. Is, so there, uh, can you kind of characterize how many? You know, how many are? I, I visualize the older style system where it was actually a, a set of concrete blocks. So it was one large one, smaller one that moved around, and then a bunch of chain and a whole bunch of stuff. Is that are are there any of those left? Or is there there are the big blocks from that system left. So um, what Leonard is describing is a like a 2000 pound block with a chain with a 500 pound block next to it. And it was, I think it was supposed to be kind of like a bungee cord and it would help absorb some of the shock uh, if, if there were big waves in the anchorage. But what would happen most of the time is that there'd be a connection failure on those chains and then you'd just be connected to a 500 pound block. Um, or that 500 pound block would would spin around the big block and it would end up causing what they call it like the circle of death. It just created a groove and it'd kill everything on the seabed, all the, whatever was down there. And so that, those went, I don't know when they went away, but I, there was a realization and you know, 20, 25 years ago that that was not the industry standard anymore. Um, helical screws have probably been the industry standard for about the last 15 years. And I, what I understand is that as concrete anchors were failing or getting drug away, then they'd put helical screws in their place. 
Um, but it's been, I think the last helical screws we put in were probably 12 or 13 years ago. So we have a bunch of catching up to do. Reed, uh, is uh, money an issue? Money is not an issue at the moment. It will be when we get into the in installation phase. Right now, there's a there's an acknowledgement that we have a lot of deferred maintenance, um, and so the budget is pretty good for maintenance at the moment. As we you know we and we have an RCO grant, a Recreation Conservation Office grant for the design work and the permitting. Um, it's when we go to do that installation that that money may become an issue. Is there something we as voters can do to help that? Um, I think just, you know, letting the, the director, we have a new director, Peter Mayer, letting director know that, hey, buoys are important to us. Um, supporting the boating infrastructure grant. I don't know if folks are aware of that, but that's a recreation conservation office grant that may be funded through fuel taxes. I'm not sure. It but is. The boat, yes. It is? Okay. So the boating infrastructure grant provides grants for a lot of, uh, you know, mostly for uh, marinas and uh, docks and, and that kind of thing, but really supporting that program because that's where a lot of money comes from for installing new and replacing um, aging infrastructure. It Reed, it feels like being out there on a popular weekend or in the summer, we need about twice as many mooring buoys as we have. Uh, what, what can we do to help accelerate uh, your process? There, I, I think we're always going to be over capacity. There's always going to be more interest than we can ever provide. If, you know, I kind of equate it to like campground at Deception Pass. It's full seven days a week this time of year. Um, we could never build a campground that could hold all the, the people or even half the people that wanted to camp there. Um, and it would really change the experience. And so we haven't done, we have to do the analysis to say, yeah, we want to serve, we, we think it's right to serve this many boats. Um, we haven't done that yet. I think, you know, really saying the director, um, you know, hey, these are, we, well, this is really important. And um, we think over time helping us say, hey, these are places we we really want to go. We've, people historically go, um, giving that, giving us that information would be super helpful. Okay. Well, we, we uh, at the Wagner Guide would be happy to help with that. We know these anchorages fairly well and we get to all of them, uh, just about all of them every summer. And we can see the shortcomings. We've also had as guests on this show, uh, the uh, organizations that are promoting eelgrass and eelgrass areas and understand that problem also. So uh, uh, we'll, we'd be happy to help uh, with your director and, and brief him on what we know. Great. 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 Thank you. We have a question here in uh, the chat. Can we use a buoy if we don't have a dinghy to go ashore? And that might be the idea behind your pilot program at Gerald Cove, possibly. Yeah, for sure. That that would that eliminates the need to go pay pay on shore. Um, and I I don't I haven't heard how that pilot program is going. I imagine it's pretty popular. There isn't cell service in in all the places that we have buoys. Um, some places we have docks, and if you can go, you know, if you can manage to get on the dock and pay on shore and then go hang on a buoy, that, that might be a way to do it. The question also about do all monies from the annual mortgage permits and daily fees go to maintenance of the buoys? That is a good question that I don't know the answer to, but I can find that out. Um, it probably goes to the general, the general state parks fund, just like you know, campgrounds and discover passes kind of goes all to the fund, but I will check on that. This is an interesting one too. I'm curious to the answer. Now somebody asked any idea of the condition of the uh, the buoys at Patos Bay or Patos Island? Um, I believe they are both missing at the moment. 
So that we are planning to be there the early part, like about a week and a half, the 19th or the 20th, we're hoping to get there. So I know one broke off this spring, and I think in the meantime, the second one has broken off. What can we do for you, Reed? Um, I guess continue to encourage really safe boating and, and access to the general public, um, making boating more inclusive and uh, more, the more people are out there advocating, the better. Um, I think we're, I feel really supported in the organization. You know, I know that we're on the new director's radar and there's a lot of, I feel like we have a lot of momentum going towards this work. Um, so I feel like we're, we're going in, in a great direction at the moment. And so, um, you know, continuing to, to speak up when you see things that you don't like or say, hey, what about that thing? Um, getting that to a, getting that to state parks management is great. But uh, so that communication is helpful. Great. I have a question here about uh, weight. Uh, 45 foot boats can vary in weight. Is there a weight limit? There is not. Um, we haven't discussed that recently. Our contractor can stress test our anchors, but we haven't we haven't gone down that road yet. Um, most a lot of people don't know how much their boat weighs, and there are you know a forty five foot sailboat is a lot different than a giant forty five foot cruiser with a lot of windage. So. Um, I understand, you know, there's, there's differences, but we don't, we haven't set, we haven't discussed that. A uh, question for Craig is, uh, can we use our annual Washington Marine Parks Pass uh, for our, our buoys? Boy, that is another good question. I don't know. Um, because I don't do any of the, you know, the Rangers do, the Rangers in each area do the fee collection and the enforcement. Um, these are things that are out of my wheelhouse, but I will find out. Okay, and we'll um, pass that on if you get an answer to us. Thank you. Yeah. The net uh, question here, the, a boater says, after tying to the buoy, should, should we put our boat in reverse to test the strength of the buoy to hold the boat? <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'd say, I'd say we don't need any more stress testing. Um, than having your boat hanging on the buoy. So, yeah. Um, what was the other question there? Oh. The, uh, do, so do you know uh, on the pilot program that's going on at Gerald Cove, are mm -hmm. there plans to expand that uh, next year or, uh, or is there an evaluation? And they, the other critical one is, uh, is, is there a place, do you want uh, user feedback from this pilot program? And if so, how do we, how do boaters give you feedback on the pilot program? That's, those are good questions. So um, I don't know what the, I don't, I haven't heard anything about how the pilot program is going. I think probably it'll at least run through the summer and kind of take a look at it over the fall and, and see how it worked out. Um, I think feedback would be great. I think sending it to that info center, let me just go back a slide. Sending, sending any feedback uh, to this email would be the best way for it to get to the right people. Just, just you know, put in the subject line, the Gerald Cove uh, pilot online, or you know, pay by phone pilot program, and that'll get to the right people. I have a question about your uh, uh, linear moorage and uh, what's, I guess, what's your view, the Parks Department view of linear moorage versus buoys? Uh, are they better? Are they equal? Uh, what's the, uh, and, and how does that influence the uh, future plans for linear moorage versus buoys? I, I personally don't have an opinion about that. I think from what I understand from the past is that uh, boaters generally aren't as pleased with lineal moorage buoys because, or mooring systems because you end up kind of feels like you're, a, you're kind of in a trailer park where you can't get away from everybody. So you might end up really close to somebody you don't want to be that close to. And um, 
and you can't actually get off like a dock. Um, so that's, that's what I've heard and I can see that. Um, they're proprietary and they're a little more challenging to, to maintain as well. So I don't, I don't foresee us putting more of them in. Um, I, there was one at Blake Island that was, that was pulled a number of years ago. And I think that was more of a maintenance situation, just the exposure it got uh, where it was located. But I, I haven't heard people resoundingly enjoying being on them. So that's, and, and just, just for your information, the, uh, that's kind of what we hear. We, it's not a resounding thing. It's not one of those where, where, where we find everybody weighing in one, on one side or the other. But uh, you picked up on the key items. The people that do have opinions all talk about how it's very close. It's closer to, the, to your neighbor than even on a dock because the dock is usually about six, eight feet wide and, and the linear moorage, you're, you're, you're really close to the neighbor across the way. Right. So kind of a, okay. bringing you what, what we hear. About That's great. I, yeah, market research for, for me is important too. I have my <laughs> own opinions, but if I was me, I'd be in Southeast Alaska on a one buoy in its own, you know, where I, where I was working on buoys and hanging on buoys, there'd be one buoy in a one arm, one 20 mile long fjord, there'd be one single buoy and, and it was wilderness in places where you couldn't anchor. Um, so we have a, it's, it's a little different. We have a different, we're trying to meet a different need. Um, we have someone who, answered, someone who answered and said, yes, we have used our pass to pay for buoys. Of course you need the pass number. Well, one of the other questions there that uh, somebody was asking if you have a more uh, an annual pass, uh, do you have to go inshore and uh, register with your pass? I I would I would assume yes, um, so that we can track the use. You know, they, we track our um, all parks departments track the amount of use, and then we can say, hey, you know, we had this many nights of buoy use in this place, and. Um, we had a capacity this many times, and uh, maybe we need more, or that, that kind of, those kinds of things. Reed, one of the things we've seen in British Columbia that's been pretty successful is the addition of stern ties into the rocks and places so that you can get more boats in. They drop their anchor, but right. then they're tying their stern so they're not moving around, and you can fit more boats in a particular area. Has that come up at all in your department? It has. It's come up a couple times in the last month or so. Um, I, I think we're still in the early part of gathering info about what, you know, from, a, from trying to get some info from BC Parks, because I know that it's going on up there. Um, also trying to talk with the uh, permitting regulators about what their thoughts are on that. I'd be curious to hear from you folks about what your, what your impressions are. I know from when I've done it that it's it's not a beginner operation you know you have to you have to kind of know what you're doing um and just curious what the thoughts are about how often that would be used and um mark you have thoughts on that well we we um, there is a group up there called bc parks forever and they're a nonprofit that has we can connect you with the people there but they have uh, uh, collected money from the public and then they've gone out and installed these where it's very clear to see, it's sturdy, it's reasonably easy to access it. And uh, 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 they, they've opened up some areas that are very popular to allow more boats like Desolation Sound. And uh, I, would, I would highly recommend it. It uh, seems to be a very robust system and I, I don't see the new user problems that you're describing. And I think it's because they have a good, a good installation. In other words, it's on a rock wall where you can bring your rib or dinghy right up to that rock wall sure. to grab the chain. The chain is marked with yellow paint. And uh, anyway, uh, uh, okay. I, I think we could give a very favorable opinion about the benefits of it. And it is doable for two people, one at the home of the mothership, the other in the dinghy taking the line ashore. 
and back yeah. might take some practice, but it's doable for two people. And uh, we certainly have found places where we said, oh gosh, if they only had a stern tie here, we could, mm -hmm. we could use this spot. So uh, it, it would open up, it would keep voters in Washington if there are more facilities and places to go, definitely. Okay. Do people typically, are people doing their own stern ties very often? Off, you know, trees or logs or anything? Is that no. common? No. no. Okay. Not a, not as many as other areas I've voted, like the Caribbean, where we run a line around a palm tree. Uh, there are issues in BC where uh, they've prohibited you from running a line around a tree because of the damage it does to the tree. Sure. On so, a tree, anyway. Yeah, not yeah. a live tree, but you can use uh, something that's sturdy, that's dead, a huge boulder, or boulder. An, uh, a stump of a tree. Sure. Okay. Great. Thanks for that. What yeah, else? Well, Susha would be perfect for a, a, a test installation of that because of some of the rock walls that are uh, in Susha and Mesha or Petos for that matter. Okay. I also want to commend you about the uh, island in uh, uh, in Deception Pass, uh, not the island, but the island dock. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> I use it for training often, and it's just perfect being right out in the middle of the water. And I love that you put a picnic table on it. Good. That, at Bowman Bay there. Yes, at Bowman Bay. Yeah, great. Yeah. Now, and, are yeah. you going to put buoys back in at Bowman Bay? Because I went in to teach a couple a couple of weeks ago, and I said, Bowman Bay, we can do docking, we can practice anchoring, and we can practice on a mooring buoy. And there were no mooring buoys. There were no mooring buoys. I don't, we haven't, I don't think we will, but we haven't had the discussion in lately, so I will bring it back up. Um, I think the, I think the thought was that it was just too exposed in there, um, where it's deep enough to, to have buoys and just kind of get beat up in there. So uh, Cornet Bay on the inside of Deception Pass, for your group's knowledge, where there's been a plan to rebuild the whole marina there at the State Parks Marina facility where there's the two floating islands. And um, we're really close. And hopefully this fall, that project will happen. So it'll be a new, a whole new marina, all new floats. They'll all be connected. So there won't be isolated islands anymore out there. That'll be nice. Thank you for doing that. That hey, Reed, yeah, it's not me, but it'll be really nice. Reed, one of you, on one of your slides on the uh, mooring buoys, you had no rafting, uh, but on the state parks website, it says there is rafting uh, at certain locations. It varies by location. Uh, uh -huh. can you, is that a, yeah. a history versus where you're going? In other words, the history was because uh, I remember the buoys that used to uh, have on the buoy, it would indicate how many boats could raft based upon size. Uh, but right. uh, can you address that? Yeah, so the I, I don't know when the decision was made, um, but the decision was essentially that we were just getting too, too much weight on the buoys. Um, as vessels, generally vessels have been getting bigger and bigger and heavier and heavier and more cruisers, less, you know, there's less, Boston whalers and more Nordic tugs out there. Um, and so the weight was just getting to be too much. Um, so, and I don't know when that decision was made, but all of our, all of our new decals and all, on our, all of our new buoys or freshly maintained buoys will, will be one boat buoys. So, but are there still some older buoys out there that do indicate some rafting? There probably are. I, I don't know. I, I would imagine we still have some tire buoys out at um, Stewart Island and out at Mystery Bay that we're hoping to replace pretty soon. The ones at Stewart Island should be gone by, you know, the, this time next week. The ones at Mystery Bay may be there a little bit longer before we can get there. But um, there, so there, I have no idea what's all out there. There's so, such a mishmash of stuff. 
we're going to miss those tire buoys and the nice black <laughs> marks they'd leave on our call. Are yeah. you going to keep one? Are you going to keep one of those and put them in your museum? <laughs> somewhere? I mean, everybody remembers those things. Well, I saw somebody has their private float at at Reed Harbor and on a tire buoy that looks like it was probably ours at one point. I, hard telling, but that one will stay there. I bet. Um, the ones in the Forest Service tire buoys in Southeast, at least on the Ketchikan district, we'd go around and we'd paint the tires, we'd replace the zincs and we'd paint the tires every year. And that makes me realize that Alaska is totally different permitting wise. We wouldn't paint, put marine paint on a tire in the water here in Puget Sound. But, <laughs> but yeah. I would agree that wouldn't go over well with certain environmentalists. Reed, no. This has been fantastic. I mean, you know, uh, to be honest, we all go out there and, you know, when we can't find enough buoys or, or when that buoy is slapping in the middle of the night, we, you know, we utter, utter the Washington state's name in vain. But at the same time, uh, it, it's a very worthwhile program. And uh, we thank you and, and please pass us on to your, your crews for the work that they do to maintain it. It's well, well appreciated. Very much appreciated. Well, it's my pleasure. I'm super pleased, super pleased to get to do this work. I work with great folks and get to go to beautiful places. And it's it's kind of a dream for me. I I didn't realize this job existed until I saw it. And once I saw it, I said, that's the job for me. So I'm very happy to be be doing the work. And well, we probably have some little viewers out there that are watching tonight saying, when I grow up. I want to be like Reed. Do that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I try to bring my, my boys don't get to come with me to work here, but they, they like to be out there too. So it's, uh, it was, and today I saw at the boat launch at Cornette Bay, there were a couple little guys jumping on their, on their dad's boat. They were really excited. What are you doing with that big pile of white things in your boat? So yeah, <laughs> that's great. That's good. Good, good stuff. Thanks oh, for having yeah. me. Thank you so much for your time. And again, pass on. And, and I meant it that Leonard, Lorena, and I will be happy to help wherever we can with our knowledge of the area and on the feedback that we get uh, from boaters. It's part of our strategic direction to try to push for more mooring balls. That, uh, it's something well needed. Yeah. Thanks so much. Okay. Thank you. And uh, for everybody, we're uh, going to call it a night here. Uh, uh, we're going to have uh, two more shows in, in uh, July, uh, and uh, we're going to ask you for a break in August. We're going to go on hiatus. Uh, it turns out that Leonard, Marina, myself will be out boating, and uh, 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 it's a little tougher for us when we're out there to cobble together the connections on every Thursday night, but we promise we're going to gra grab some great content for you. And then we'll be back in September with a full schedule going right through the winter for Seattle Boat Show Live. So uh, we, yeah, we will be filling out uh, the rest of July. So be sure and tune in next Thursday. We have Amy Eberling from the Salish Sea School and, and talking about young people. That's what uh, the school is all about. It's students for marine conservation. And these young people actually go out on the boat and they uh, do research and surveys and what a great opportunity. I wish they had that when I was a kid. So tune in and uh, next Thursday to learn all about that. And where will you be Landon's next Thursday? Actually, we'll Not still be here in Sitka. Yeah. That's our plan. <laughs> oh, okay. We have, we have family coming in to visit. So we're gonna spend some time here. Yeah. Great, great, okay. I'll be out on the water next week. Say hi if you see uh, Sea Raven, my 30-foot tolly craft, going, working my way down, uh, uh, down Saratoga Passage. And uh, we'll, we'll have more for you next week. And if you have anything that any of you see in the water, please uh, send it to us at the Wagner Guide, info at wagnerguide.com, and we'll grab that. We'll answer questions or, or we'll put your updates up on the air and give you credit, and make you famous. So uh, anyway, that's it for tonight. Good night, everybody. Thank you very much, and be safe there out on the water. Bye, Thanks. everyone. Bye. Bye.